later as um, a staff worker with the school. The Highland School for Problems, situated on top of one of the schools in Tennessee, called Mount Eagle, Tennessee. I was able to enroll in citizenship education program, a program to eliminate and help black people to register and to vote. And that program night, we would experiment. Hey, I'd go into various communities and experiment with the program day. And then at night, to Highlander, and put this thing down. And finally, we, we called the Citizenship Education Program going. And we tried it on one of the islands on the southeast. And then bringing in people to workshops. We had one for the South. We were up here to the Southern Missouri and all over. And I was surprised to know that there were Northern whites and Southern whites and Southern blacks and Northern blacks who would come into those workshops. Highlander Folk School vouched for it. We slept in the same room. And that was really surprising to um, the Southerners there to see that we could all sleep together and the air wasn't poisonous uh, anymore. So we did that. And uh, we went into the workshops, and there they would tell about the problems that they had. Because the box came in 1955 in August and spent two, uh, two weeks with us. And she was really afraid to speak. She was working with a youth CP. As she said, the NACP was coming, we sent her fair so she could come. She brought her mother along with her. But her mother was so afraid she never would come down into that dining room and eat with that mixed group. Never would. We had to take her food up to her. And when she got ready to go back home, I had to go as far as uh, Atlanta with Rosa and her mother until they got on the bus for Alabama. They didn't know what was going to happen to them in Tennessee. This was the kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, um, one night, the um, in the bedroom, the young uh, people and Rosa was saying, you don't know how hard it was to get the freedom train to come to um, Alabama, because they wouldn't come unless we would let the children come in line as they were. And so we, uh, the, some of the people asked some questions. They tell us about this Rosa, and she told how they worked hard and finally got the freedom train. And the children came and lined up, and they went through this train, black and the white and the black and the white. And she said, and this is what we did. So the next day in the workshop, some of them asked Rosa to tell that. And she was afraid to tell it because she said, I had to go back home. And there's no telling what they will do to me. And that was so true. There was no telling. Because her husband was a barber, and her husband couldn't get work with any of the people that he'd been working with before. And nevertheless, she told her story there, and she went back home. And on December the 1st, 1955, that same year, Rosa was sitting in a bus. She worked downtown at a dress shop. And she said all day long she'd been working on a heavy coat in this shop. And she was tired. So she went in the section of that bus that was designed for blacks. You know, you had ten seats to the front for whites. And you had to sit to the back. But if the whites uh, crowded out the section that they had, then you had to stand up and give them your seat. I did that many times right in Charleston, South Carolina. I taught at the... Uh, Henry Piaccia School. I would get on a bus on a corner of Meeting and Kilham Street, and the men would be going to the Navy Yard. And if the section of the bus filled up before I got to my school, I'd have to get up, stand up, and stand up and give them the seat that was really designed for blacks. This was the way that the segregation thing worked. Nevertheless, Rosa said that day, she was tired, and she decided that she was not going to stand up, and so she didn't. 
she sat in that seat. The conductor came back and demanded that she move, mm -hmm. but she wouldn't move. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, the bus driver drove to the nearest police and had her arrested. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was really a great turning point for all of us. Mm -hmm. She had to go to jail. Here was this respected black woman mm -hmm. having to go to jail, sitting in the seat that was designed for black people to sit in and had to move because a white man wanted that seat. And so all of the black people then became aware of that thing, and they decided that uh, they would go to the bat for it. Miles Horton, the founder and director of the Highland Folk School, was at my house that day. We were showing a film in Charleston to teachers called The Face of the South, showing how they worked. and. Uh, after that film, we had a hard time there too, but they came to the school where we were to ask Miles about this thing and he made no comment. He got on the plane then. He, he looked at the paper and he saw that Rosa was arrested. So he got on the plane and immediately went down to Montgomery. And that night there was a big workshop. Naturally, black people would be afraid, numbers of them. But Reverend Abernathy, and other members uh, of the black um, ministers there got the black people together. And when they got them together, uh, they decided that we're not going to ride those buses anymore. And so they took Rosa Parks out of jail, however. It was, the fine was only $10, I understand. And Mr. Ed Nixon, who was with the NAACP at the time, got her out. But the blacks decided that they wouldn't go. All of them who were at that meeting. Well, on Sunday, the ministers preached in the church about that. And uh, a number of um, whites said, black people aren't going to ride the buses anymore. And the police department decided that they would ride behind these buses on Monday morning and uh, keep them from going on the buses or keep down the fight. Mm -hmm. And when the blacks saw the uh, motorcycle cops, they knew then that they were not going to get on those buses, so they didn't <coughs> get on. And of course, you know the rest of the story. For about 381 days, they walked. And guess what? India and China sent money to buy they bought, um, I think they were Cadillacs, long black cars. And I went down there once or twice. There were about 99 or more taking people back and forth uh, to their work. But some of the white women, oh, and see, I see, I have relatives here. They're coming to meet me. <laughs> so <laughs> the um, minister came and met me. That day in the church, the White Citizen Council, a man lived right across, not too far from the church. I can't think of his name now, but he was head of that group. He came there with his group and threw tear gas bombs into that church, all over the carpet. And our young people got so sick, they went out on the grass and just vomited. This was the kind of thing that we had to put up with. But uh, we, it didn't stop us. We went along. And we kept working. I went into Grenada, uh, Mississippi, and while I was there, we were having a, a meeting in one of the Baptist churches. And we just finished our meeting, and I got out on that sidewalk, and that whole church went into flames. And when did those people get in there to put those um, fire bombs or whatever they were? in all corners of the church, I don't know. But it wasn't but five minutes before when we stepped out. But you know, that didn't stop us. The next day we met and we talked with our people again and kept them going. Uh, some of the whites caught a 15-year-old boy outside of that church the next day. Now, I don't know whether you heard about it, but they bounced him up and down on that sidewalk and broke his left leg, it was, in two or three places. And people from the north and other places sent money. I'd take him all the way to Clarksdale to hospital so he could be treated. Uh, but I say out of all of these things, 
you find some good come because today in Alabama, after all of the things that we had to go through in Alabama and Montgomery and uh, being surrounded by the Ku Klux Klan and Natchez and uh, other places, uh, I found out that there were always some people who had some kind of a human spirit about them and would come to your rescue. Uh, well, yeah. We had to leave. Well, Dr. King wanted to expand his program, so I went down to the Atlanta and worked out from there. I always have to meet with them and get them to let the people know that you mean good, because they can't take you even though you're black. Hey. But um, I said, well, we were at Southern Christian Leadership Conference, well, and they wanted to know um, how you're going to advertise. I said, well, we're Morning. And uh, five days a week, and uh, we paid them. And there were we had schools <coughs> number when they could write their names. So seven thousand two persons in Selma, Alabama, on May the third, nineteen sixty-six. There was an election. It was the funniest thing. I was in Camden.